Okay, good morning or good afternoon. Um, welcome back to Free Talk. Today we are going to continue our discussion of logarithms, which we just kind of barely introduced on Tuesday. Um, so today we're going to formally define what a logarithm is. I'll show you all the notation. We'll go through lots of practice evaluating, graphing, and finding domains, stuff like that. Um, before we get into that, I need to talk to you about some bookkeeping stuff. So let me flip over to the dot cam and we can get moving in earnest. This is a bit unfortunate, but I've been thrown something of a hiccup um, in the past. So let's let's do the thing first. This is MAC. 1140 section 009, which is pre calculus. And today is the 4th of November 2021. Um, I am working on your exams. They're not done just yet. I had a bunch of people taking makeup tests, taking them in different places. And I have some people who still have not taken it yet. And for that reason, I don't want to release all of the comments. Um, but I am, I am getting there. And so far, the average is not bad. So um, don't panic. So far, everything looks pretty good. Um, <clears throat> but the announcement is not related to that. So here at Santa Fe and at any um, two-year college in the state of Florida, there are um, on final exams, typically a few questions that are marked as Jello questions. And Jello stands for General Education Learning Outcome. These are questions that the state asks us to put on our tests and track in order to see how the college is doing, right? See uh, how one college is performing compared to another college. And uh, those kind of main learning outcomes we want to measure, for example, how our Santa Fe is doing compared to uh, Valencia or State College of Florida, other places like that. We used to do those on the final exam. There would just be one or two questions that were marked with a G on the final, and those were the Jello questions. This semester, though, the department has changed how they do things. Rather than having the Jellos be on the final, we're putting the Jellos into worksheets. And while I'm not crazy about it, I have to go along with what the department is doing. To that end, there will be a Jello assignment posted to Canvas. Uh, sometime in the next week. Now, since in the syllabus, I don't have any place for a score for this thing, I have to figure out how to give you some point incentive to do it. And the way this is going to work is there are four questions. And each correct answer will earn you One bonus point on the last midterm. Um, this assignment is not optional. I need you guys to do it. And you'll have, I don't know, like two weeks to do the thing. I'll show you the thing now, or at least the version I was sent. So here it is. This is the thing that I was sent and I was told that I've got to have you guys do it. This time it's on transformations of graphs, which is fine. I think that's an area where we all need a little bit more practice. And it's something that we all really want to get good at before we come into Calc 1, because it's a, a hugely important skill. 
Um, <clears throat> but I think these graphs are kind of ugly. The idea of having mathematics in a doc file just makes me want to puke. So I am going to retype set this in LaTeX as a PDF because that's the only way mathematics should ever really be shared. Um, but these will be the questions. I'm not allowed to change the questions. So these are them. You will be given the graph of a function f, and the graph will look like this. The first question is going to ask you to describe how to get the graph of f of x minus 2 and f of x minus 2, right? So subtracting 2 on the inside, subtracting 2 on the outside from the graph of f. In other words, list the transformations. The second question, you are going to graph each of these on this coordinate axis. So you're going to sketch the graph of each of those transformed functions. Whatever the transformation is, you apply that transformation and then draw that new graph. Um, the third question, you're going to answer whether the original function f is even, odd, or neither. All right, just tell me it's an even function, this is an odd function, or this function is neither even nor odd. And then the very last question, has nothing to do with this function, totally new function. We say if f of four is equal to three and k of x is the function two plus f of x plus one, what point can you deduce is on the graph of k of x? So you'd want to identify the transformations here and then identify the point they're talking about here and figure out if you apply those transformations to the point that's on the graph from this information, what point would be on the graph of the transformed function? So this little worksheet on transformations is the way the department is doing jellos this year. Um, it's a change that they made, I think, due to the pandemic. It's not entirely clear. Um, and again, I, I really don't like the way this is typeset. I think this is very ugly, so I'll be retypesetting it for you with prettier looking graphs. But you will need to do these. Uh, it's just four questions. I think it'll go very, very quickly for you. And each correct answer here will earn you a uh, bonus point on the last midterm. Uh, the catch is you're not allowed to work with anybody else. You do have to do these on your own. I'll put a little honor pledge on it. Um, and that's the deal, OK? So it is a required assignment, this Jello assignment, which I'll post to Canvas sometime uh, this week, is a required assignment. There are four questions, and each correct answer will earn you one bonus point on the last midterm. Um, so please, I, I beg of you, please do the thing. You've got two weeks to do it. It's not a rush thing. I want to make sure that you don't fall behind on your homework or any quizzes in, in, in uh, WebAssign, anything like that. I want you to keep up with what we're doing in class. But um, transformations is a topic we all need a little bit extra practice with. It's something that's going to be really big in Calc 1. And um, yeah, so that's it. It's just a, it's a statistic that the state needs from us. And because they need it from us, I got to get it from you. Um, I don't want it to be punitive, but I do ask that you please get it in by the, the deadline that I put in Canvas. So the due date there will be two weeks after I post it. I'll try to get it typeset today and posted today, but it may take me another day or so because I'm still working on grading tests. Okay, that's it. So today, we're talking about logarithms, which is section 4.3. Uh, you may have noticed that there is a sizable homework set up for you. It's a 45 question homework set that I posted on Tuesday. Um, that's not going to be due for you until next Tuesday. That wasn't due today because it is a longer one and we haven't talked about logs yet. And I am going to post a second homework set. It'll be much shorter. It'll just have some graphing problems, some domain and range questions, things like that. Um, <clears throat> all right. So logarithms. Last time, We said the solution to the equation two to the x equals three has something to do with the inverse of the function f of x equals 2 to the x. And I gave you the uh, approximate value of that solution. Um, it was like 1.5846 something or whatever. <clears throat> but you haven't seen where it comes from yet. And I told you that it comes from the inverse of this function, 
which is called a logarithm. Uh, so today we're going to explore logarithms in detail. And then once we have kind of gotten comfy with what logarithms are, I will show you how to solve this equation exactly and many other equations like it exactly using these tools called logarithms. Um, so that inverse was f inverse of x. And the way we write it is as the log base 2 of x. So this is the notation. I'll give you the general definition down here in just a minute. But the idea is when you look at the graph of 2 to the x, this is definitely a one-to-one -one function, right? That graph definitely passes the horizontal line test. So he is one-to-one. -one. But if you write down y equals two to the x and you try to solve for x, you run into the same problem you run in with here. So there's no algebra formula for the inverse of this function. You're not going to be able to like divide by or take square roots or do any of the normal sort of equation solving things to come up with a formula for the inverse of this guy. So what we do instead is we say, well, we know there is an inverse because this function is one-to-one -one, and one-to-one -one functions always have inverses. Since I can't find a formula for it, let me just give the thing a name. I'll say that the inverse of this function is this function. I'll give it a name. I'll call it the base two logarithm. And then I'll try to deduce all the properties of this logarithm function by remembering that it is the inverse of this exponential function and using the stuff that we learned back in section 2.8 about inverses. Over time, we will develop some algebra properties for the logarithm, but you will never get a nice algebra formula for the logarithm. There isn't one. Uh, in Calc 2, you will get kind of an infinitely long algebra formula for logarithms but there is no nice algebra formula for these things. So we have to work with them in a rather abstract way. And that's one of the reasons why this section uh, is a bit challenging. However, uh, we certainly can define the logarithm and we can characterize it in a number of different ways that make it easy to do certain things like evaluating the logarithm, graphing the logarithm, stuff like that. And in order to do any of that, I should give you the, the general definition. So that's where we're going next. So here's our definition. The base A logarithm is defined to be the inverse of the base A exponential. Um, that is, if f of x is A to the x, then f inverse x is, and the way we read this is that the log base a of x. So the a here is a little subscript. This is the word log, L-O-G. It is a function. And the specific version that we're talking about is the base a logarithm. That a is the same as the base of the exponential here. The a is written as a subscript, a little bit below the word log. And then these parentheses here, this is function notation. This is the base a log of x. So log sub a, that's not a number or a variable. And this is not multiplication. This is function notation. So log base a is like g. This is like g of x, log base a of x, same thing. Um, <clears throat> there are some immediate consequences of this. I just, before we, before we move on, I want to note the base A is always positive. Uh, 
right? Because it is the same number that we're using as the base for an exponential, and we talked about that last time, we only ever use positive numbers as the base for an exponential, the base of the logarithm here, that number A will always be positive. Okay, uh, some immediate consequences of the definition. We know that if you have a function with an inverse, f and f inverse, then f inverse of f of x should always simplify to the same thing. What does that always simplify to for any function f and its inverse? x. Mm -hmm. Right, the inverse exactly undoes the original function. So if you take some number x, you apply the original function f to that, and then you apply the inverse function to all of that, you land back where you started. This is your feet, putting on your shoes, taking off your shoes. If you put on your shoes, then take off your shoes, you get your bare feet back. And if you compose in the other order, If you start with x, then you do f to that, and then you do f, oops, sorry, this is the same thing I said last time, sorry. If you compose in the other order, if you start with x, then you do f inverse to that, then you do f to that, same thing, right? f and f inverse undo each other exactly, so you'll always land back at x. So, <clears throat> I can rewrite both of these statements using these specific functions, right? For f, I will use a to the x, and for f inverse, I will use the base a log of x. Then this first statement becomes the base a log of a to the x equals x. And the second statement becomes a raised to the power of, right? Because that's what this original function is. It's a raised to the power of whatever's in here. So this is a raised to the power of f inverse x, which is the base a log of x. This is also equal to x. And when we're thinking of logarithms as tools for solving equations, this is generally what we'll use. It's an immediate consequence of the definition. Just saying that one function is the inverse of the other, literally the meaning of that is that when you plug one of those functions into the other functions, they annihilate each other and you just get the inside back. Now, another way of saying this <clears throat> is that um, if the base a log of some number, if the base a log of x is equal to y, that means that a to the y is equal to x. And I'm, I'm going to take this second statement here and interpret it um, in plain English in addition to saying it algebraically like this. <clears throat> But these are kind of the two equivalent formulations of what a logarithm does. And again, this is sort of the way we like to think about it when we're solving equations. And this is more the way we think about it when we're trying to evaluate logarithms. 
And they really do mean the same thing. If you take this y and you plug this thing, which is equal to y, in here, then you see that a raised to the log base a of x equals x. That's this statement. On the other hand, if you take this guy, a to the y, which is equal to x, and you plug that in here, then you get the base a log of a to the y equals y, which is the same thing as this, just with the variables changed. So the two blue statements say the same thing as each other. And this first blue statement is just coming from the definition of an inverse function. Now, the second blue statement I want to characterize in plain English, because this is the easiest way to start playing with logarithms. So imagine you had to explain to someone who's never taken an algebra class before what this second blue statement says. This says <clears throat> that the base a log of x, whatever the hell that thing is, we called it y, that the base a log of x is the number that you need to raise a to in order to get x, right? Base a log of x is y and a to the y is x. That means that this number, the base a log of x, like if you were to plug a number in here for x, the way you figure out what this thing is, is you ask yourself, to what power must I raise a in order to get that inside? In other words, the base a log of x is the number to which you must raise a in order to get x. And for the first part of today's lecture, this is how I want you to think of the logarithm. It's just coming from this statement. but it's a plain English statement. So if you want to figure out what this thing is, again, there's no nice algebra formula. Right? There is no like nice obvious algebra formula that you can plug into that will tell you uh, what the base two log of seven is or anything like that. But if you want to try to figure out what that number is, this is the way you think about it. So the output from this function is the number to which you must raise the base in order to get the inside. And we're going to get some practice with this. Uh, before we get practice with this, I want to work directly with the blue box statement. Uh, you have a bunch of problems in your homework that give you a log statement and ask you to rewrite it as an exponential statement, or give you an exponential statement and ask you to rewrite it as a log statement. So let's practice with that. Just to be clear, this is like the log statement. And this is the equivalent exponential statement. So let's rewrite each, I can't keep that, each logarithm statement as an exponential statement. Um, I will use some abbreviations. Also, you remember uh, I've been using EXP in place of the word exponential. I will use just LOG in place of the word logarithm sometimes because it's just a lot of writing. All right, so some logarithm statements for us to rewrite as exponentials. Each one of these is a true statement. There's nothing for us to solve. 
we just want to re-express the true statement about logs as a true statement about exponentials. So. Here we go. Let me get this out of the way for now. I don't want to clutter. So look at the second blue box statement. What does it mean to say that the base 10 log of 100,000 is equal to 5? What is the equivalent statement about powers? The 10 to the power of 5 it's going to be that number. Yeah, exactly. Right. When I say that the base 10 log of 100,000 equals 5, that means that 10 to the power of 5 is 100,000. Right. That this raised to this is this. OK. What is the equivalent exponential statement to log sub two of eight equals three? What is the equivalent statement about powers? The two to the power three equals eight. Very good, All right? Same thing, that base raised to this number equals the inside of the logarithm. All right. I'd like to hear a little bit from some of my shy people. I know it's easy to hide behind the camera here, but uh, I, I would really love to hear from some folks that I haven't heard from a lot lately. This next one may not be quite as obvious, but if you follow the same pattern, you will get the correct result here either way. So what is the equivalent exponential statement to log base three of one ninth equals two, uh, negative two? What are we saying about powers here? Um, someone put it in the chat, but three to the negative two power equals one over nine. Perfect. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh both Jalen and, and Darian. Yeah, that's exactly correct, right? The base raised to the output is the inside, just like the first two. So this is equivalent to saying three to the negative two is one ninth. And you might have to think about it for a second, but this is a true statement, right? Three to the negative two, that means the reciprocal of three squared, which is one over three to the two, Three to the two is nine, so it's one over nine. Yeah, that is true, okay. And this is also true. It's just the equivalent way of saying it in terms of logarithms. So because there is no nice algebra formula for something like this, we have to get very good at going back and forth between these two ways of thinking about things. All right, the next one is a little bit silly. But again, follow the same pattern. Maybe I could hear from someone fresh like Sarah or Haley. What does the log base pi of one equal zero mean? <clears throat> mm, I don't know. <laughs> So we follow, follow the same sort of pattern. So the base is always the base here. The number on the right-hand side is always the power. And the right-hand side here is always the number on the inside. So we'd be saying that pi 
raised to some power is equal to one. What power should go there? Yeah, very good, zero, zero, right? So each of these are equivalent statements and we wanna get very comfortable going back and forth. Uh, right now we're learning about logarithms, right? So these statements feel weird but we've spent a week and a half talking about exponentials and powers. So these statements should feel pretty comfy, like two cubed is eight. Well, two times two times two, yeah, that's eight. Or pi to the zero is one. Yeah, well, anything to the zero is one. In fact, the fact that, that this works, no matter what you use in place of pi, is going to tell us an important property of logarithms a little bit later on. So you could change this pi with a seven or a 12 or a 10 or an e, and you would still get zero out. <clears throat> the log with any base of one is always zero because any base to the zero will always be one. Okay. What I'd like to do next is give you some similar stuff to these but I'm not going to tell you the numbers on the right-hand side. I'm gonna just ask you, what is the base 10 log of 100,000? What is the base two log of eight? Stuff like that. And we're gonna figure them out by thinking about the corresponding statement about powers. So instead of rewriting each as a statement about exponentials, we're going to just evaluate each log expression. Um, uh, we'll start gentle, something like the base 10 log of 1,000, the base 2 log of 32, and then the base 10 log of 0 0.1 and the base 16 log of 4. All right. So each one of these, I want to know what is these, what are these equal to? In other words, what is the base 10 log of 1,000 and why? It's three. Very good, it's three, right? The base 10 log of 1,000 is three because if you take 10 and raise it to the third power, you get 1,000, right? And this is this orange statement. So the base a log of x, if you want to figure out what this thing is for some specific number a and some specific number x, you need to figure out what power of a will give you x. So to what power must you raise a, the base, in order to get x, the inside? So when I look at the base 10 log of 1,000 and I ask myself, what is this number? It's the number to which you must raise 10, 10 to what power equals 1,000. All right, with that in mind, can we find the base two log of 32? Five. Very good, that's five. All right, we're asking to what power must I raise the number two in order to get 32? And the answer there is five. So this guy is, Five. And if we want to, we can explain, we can say because two to the five is 32. Now this next one is maybe a little bit tricky and I wanna just, just pause for a second as we come into this. This is ne negative one. It is. The reason this is negative one um, may be made more transparent if we rewrite the inside as a, as uh, something that's easier to see as a power of 10. So 0 0.1 is 1 tenth, which means that the log base 10 of 0 0.1, leaving the outside alone, not doing anything there, just rewriting 0 0.1 as 
110. So I ask myself, what power of 10 is equal to 110? To what power must I raise this base to get this inside? And just like Anna said, it's negative one, right? Because 10 to the negative one is 110. So this is negative one because 10 to the negative one is one over 10, which is 0 0.1. So this really is a new way of thinking, right? We're not thinking about multiplication or division or addition or subtraction or even roots here. Uh, we're thinking about inputs for exponential functions that lead to certain outputs. Basically, I'm asking, what is the input for the function 10 to the x that gives me the output 0 0.1? In other words, 10 to what number equals 0 0.1? And the answer is negative 1 because 10 to the negative 1 is 0 0.1. This last one's a little bit tricky. And I want us to, again, sort of take our time thinking about it. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we're asking what power of 16 is equal to 4? So 16 to the power of 1 fourth? Uh, so 16 times 1 fourth is equal to four. And that's a, a reasonable thing for our brains to do because we're used to thinking in terms of multiplication. Um, 16 raised to the one fourth power is two, right? But we're asking here 16 raised to what power is four? And, um, and the answer there is, is one half because 16 to the one half power that's the square root of 16. And the square root of 16 is indeed 4. So each time we're trying to evaluate a logarithm, we're trying to answer this question. To what power must I raise the base in order to get the inside? And through the vast majority of the homework problems that you'll see in that, that first homework set, that 45 problem homework set that I posted for you on Tuesday, um, vast majority of the logarithm problems in there are answered easiest and fastest by this, this statement. OK. There were a few things that we observed along the way here. Um, specifically that on part D of the first example, the number pi could have been replaced by any other number. And this would still be a true statement. <clears throat> That's definitely not true, for example, here, right? Like it's true that pi to the zero is one and that 10 to the zero is one and that seven to the zero is one. If you change this pi to anything else, as long as that thing is positive, this stays true. But if you change this two to a three or a seven or a 10, two to the three is eight, but seven to the three is not eight, 10 to the three is not eight. Um, so that kind of general property, something that is, that is always true for all bases, uh, we usually call those properties of the logarithm. And the first one is the one we just observed. And I want to write down a few others along with it here. So simple properties of logarithms. And we'll have some more complicated ones later. First is that the log base a of one is always going to be zero. And that's because a raised to the zero is always one, no matter what a is. Or in other words, the answer a to what number equals one is the same no matter what your number a is. The answer there is always zero. The next one is sort of similarly obvious. If I give you any positive number a and I ask you what is the base a log of a itself, to what power must I raise a in order to get a, that is true regardless of the number a. What is that answer? One. Yeah, one, right? a to the one is always equal to a. So the base a log of a is always one.
All right, these next two are sort of silly generalizations of something we already wrote down, but I am going to state it again. Oh, three. If you take the base A log of A raised to some stuff, whatever that stuff is, what do you think we should get here? The answer is going to be that stuff? Yeah, exactly. To what power must I raise A to get A to some stuff? Well, it's that stuff. And whether that stuff is a number or a variable or another function or your mom, it's always just going to be that stuff. Uh, and kind of the, the similar one corresponding to the other direction of the composition is that if you take A and you raise it to the power base A log of some stuff, this will also always be that stuff. These are sort of just restatements of the, the definition of an inverse function. But I think it's useful to remind you that this doesn't have to be a number. It could be a function. It could be a dog. It could be a house. Uh, it could be anything. The base A log of A to some stuff will always just be that stuff. So you can always simplify things like this to just the stuff. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Uh, silly examples here. The base five log of one is definitely zero. The base seven log of seven is definitely one. What about the base pi log of pi to the e, what is that going to be? e. Very good. This is e. Right? To what power must I raise pi in order to get pi to the e? That's e. Or you can just think of it as a raw application of this property. All right. And what about, uh, let's say, 12 raised to the base 12 log of um, pi. Pi? Yeah, very good. This is pi. And this may be a little less obvious, um, but this certainly is pi. Okay. No real calculation to do there. Just, just demonstrating these with specific values of A. All right. I want to talk now about graphing, domains, ranges, and some transformation problems. Um, also some notation stuff. Yeah, let's do the notation first. Your textbook does something unfortunate here. Um, first, I'll say always write parentheses. around the inside of the log. I.e., um, don't write the log base 2 of 7. Write log sub 2 of 7 like this. Your book and WebAssign do this from time to time. Actually, they do it a lot. And it's really bad notation. Um, because if I had like a, log base two of seven plus one, is this, this is ambiguous. Is it? log base 2 of 7 plus 1, or the log base 2 of 8. These are not the same. The log base 2 of 7 plus 1 is the power to which you must raise 2 to get 7 out, and then you add 1. The log base 2 of 8, this is 3. 
right, this is three. This guy, I can calculate him for you really quick. Not a nice number. This is like 3.80735. Uh, so that, that first part is like two point. Plus one, which would be three point eight zero seven. Um, so use parentheses carefully, right? Always make clear what's inside the log and what's not inside the log. If you write down something like this, I don't know whether you're talking about this or this, and they're very different animals. Second comment on notation: there are some special bases. and E. Uh, you remember when we talked about exponentials, I said all these exponential graphs kind of look the same. And so really, we just pick one that we really like. And, and we tend to use that all the time instead of using a bunch of different bases for exponential functions. The exact same thing is true for logarithms. Um, really, nobody fucks around with the base 5 log or the base 7 log or the base pi log. There's only two that anybody like to use, and that's 10 and E, and nobody really uses 10. Pretty much everybody uses E all the time. So a special notation for the base 10 logarithm is to just not write the base. So if you see LOG of something, that means the base 10 log of that thing. And this is called the common log. And you have a button on your calculator that says LOG. That is the button for the base 10 log. The other one, the base E log. <clears throat> this is the one that we actually use all the time. And you'll see over the next week as we solve problems with exponents and logs, we pretty much always use the base E log. But yeah, I don't want to have to write this whole thing all the time if I'm going to use it every day. And just like we call E to the X, the natural exponential, we call the base E log of X, the natural logarithm. And we usually just write LN of X. This is called the natural log. And the natural log is the one that everybody uses for like everything. In some different fields of math, you'll see LOG meaning other things. But LN always means natural log, always means the base E log. And this is the one that, that everybody uses for everything in the world. All right, so don't be sloppy with parentheses. Always put the inside of your log in a parentheses so I can tell what's inside and what's outside. Like, is the seven inside or the one outside, or are they both inside? This statement is ambiguous, so make sure to write it either like this if you mean the first thing, or like this if you mean the second thing. <clears throat> and then if you see log without a base, that's the base 10 log, aka the common log. If you see ln, that's the natural log or the base e log. All right, let's look at some graphs. We already graphed the base two logarithm um, at the end of class last time, but it was uh, after class had officially ended. So uh, let's go ahead and do it. And we can do this by plotting points. Uh, and using inverses. So in other words, 
I'm going to I'm going to plot points, but I'm going to get those points by thinking about the base two log as the inverse of two to the x. Okay, so here is the graph y equals two to the x. This is the point zero comma one. This is the point one comma two. This is the point two comma four. We know these are all points on the graph of the uh, graph two to the x. Over here would be like negative one comma one half. So. <clears throat> The base two logarithm, we can get his graph by taking all of those points and just swapping the x's and the y's. Um, I also want to think about what happens with the asymptote. So the original function here has asymptote y equals zero, it's a horizontal asymptote. And I want to think about what happens with domains and ranges. We went through this the other day, so we'll go quickly here. The point 0, 1 becomes the point 1, 0. The point 1, 1, 2 becomes the point 2, 1. And the point Two comma four becomes the point four comma two. The point negative one comma one half becomes the point one half comma negative one. And this horizontal asymptote becomes this vertical asymptote. We can just approach like this. So the graph of the base two logarithm looks like this. And we could have made a table of points using exactly the logic that we were applying on those previous examples where you had to evaluate logarithms. Right? If I wanted to make a table for this, I could plug in one here and I'd say, oh, the base two log of one, that's got to be zero. To get this point, I could plug in x equals two here and I'd say, oh, the base two log of two, that's got to be one. So this is one. I could plug in x equals four here and say, okay, the base two log of four that's got to be 2 because 4 is 2 squared. And the 1 half negative 1 do the same thing. If you plug in 1 half here, the base 2 log of 1 half is negative 1. If we wanted, we could also find a point where x is equal to 1 fourth. The base 2 log of 1 fourth would be what? If I want to come in here to x equals 1 fourth, which is like right there, here's the point on the graph. This would be one fourth comma what? What is the base two log of one fourth? Negative two. Yeah, very good. The base two log of one fourth is negative two. Why? Because if you take this base two and raise it to the power negative two, you get one fourth. So this point will be one fourth comma negative two. So we could have made a table if we wanted, but it's much faster to do this. Uh, you need to remember this graph. You Just like you need to remember the graphs of your exponential functions, you've got to know what those look like. You need to know this graph shape. You need to know that there's an asymptote here and that the function goes all the way down. It does not start right here. The function goes all the way down and that it grows over here like this. The domain 
is the open interval zero to infinity. It's the range of two to the x. And the range is negative infinity to infinity. It's the domain of two to the x. So please make sure this graph is nice and neat in your notes with all these points labeled, the asymptote labeled. Never, ever forget this graph. I can't tell you how many times I've had to take off points on calculus tests because students didn't know the graph of a logarithm. It's tragic. There's no excuses for it. What we're going to do now is use this graph to sketch some new graphs. like the base two log of negative x. And we're gonna do it as a transformation. Of y equals the base two log of x. So in other words, our starting point is this graph. And I want to use it to get the graph of this function. So what transformation or transformations do I need to apply to this graph, which is the base 2 log of x, to get this graph, which is the base 2 log of negative x? Flip over to um, the y-axis. Very good, very good. It's a horizontal reflection or a reflection over the y-axis. So I'm going to take every point on the graph of this original function and flip them over here. All right, we can even sketch the whole curve right away before we plot any points. Let's actually do that because that's how we think about these usually. I'm just going to take the whole graph and flip it over the y axis. So that new graph has the same vertical asymptote. And I maintain this shape, I just flip everything over here. So that's going to be like. this. Mm -hmm. We can label some points. Call this negative four. And this would be negative two. This would be negative one. So when I flip the point neg uh, 4 comma 2 over here, it becomes negative 4 comma 2. When I flip the point 2 comma 1 over here, he becomes negative 2 comma 1. When I flip the point 1 0 over here, he becomes negative 1 0. And the same thing is true of the points with negative y values, when I take 1 half negative 1 and I flip it over here, it becomes negative 1 half negative 1. And when I take positive 1 fourth negative 2 and I flip it over here, it becomes negative 1 fourth comma negative 2. So that's the deal. It's my x-axis and this is the graph y equals the base 2 log of negative x. We would want to label the vertical asymptote, which is still x equals 0. And I'd also like to state the domain and range. What's the domain of this new function? Negative infinity to 0. Excellent, right? If I kind of smush this whole graph 
onto the x-axis, everything from negative infinity up to zero gets hit. What about the range? Negative infinity to infinity. Very good. The range doesn't change, right? If I'm just flipping over horizontally, I'm not doing anything to the y values. The range remains negative infinity. All right. Any questions about how we got the purple graph from the top right black graph? Okay, I want to do one more of these. This time I would like to sketch f of x equals the base two log of x plus one as a transformation. So what is the transformation this time? We have to move it left. Very good. This is a shift left by two units. Why two if it's. Oh, I'm if sorry, sorry, sorry. Shift left by one unit. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Shift left by one unit. I've been saying the word two too many times. Yeah, so adding one on the inside shifts us left one unit. And the first thing I would draw in here is that asymptote. So I'm dragging everything to the left one unit. So that asymptote, which used to be x equals 0, is now x equals negative 1. And if I take this whole thing and I shift it to the left, that one unit, the shape doesn't change. It just kind of gets moved over. So to do my best to draw the picture. It's going to look like this. Um, we should be going through the origin here. So the point 1, 0, if I shift it left one unit, becomes 0, 0. The point two comma one, if I shift it left one unit, becomes the point one comma one. The point four comma two, if I shift it left one unit, becomes the point three comma two. And we can handle these points down here also. If I take the point one half negative one and I shift it to the left, one unit, what does that become? Negative one half? Yeah. What are we doing? We're subtracting one from the x values, right? Four minus one is three. Two minus one is one. One minus one is zero. So to get the new point, we're just subtracting one from the x value, and one half minus one is negative one half. So this is negative one half comma negative one here. And what about this guy? What is the transformed version of one fourth comma negative two? Negative 
negative three fourths. Very good. Yeah, we're again subtracting one. One fourth minus one is negative three fourths. So this is negative three fourths comma negative two. And that's it. This is our new graph. So this is again my x-axis. And this is the graph y equals the base two log of x plus one. Uh, and like before, I want the domain and range. So can you tell me the domain of this new function? Negative one to infinity. Excellent. This would be negative one to infinity. And the range? Negative infinity to infinity. Very good. Yeah, the range doesn't change because again, I'm shifting horizontally. I'm not doing anything with the y values. All right. All the same transformation rules we learned way back in chapter two, just applied to this new family of functions. Before we go much further, um, I want to draw the graph of the natural log for you and just restate some of the properties we've already discussed in terms of the natural log. e to the x looks an awful lot like 2 to the x. Grows a tiny bit faster because e is a tiny bit bigger than 2. But same basic shape, same domain, same range, same asymptote. The specific points, 0, 1 is here. 1, comma e is here. Uh, it would be a higher, I just don't have room to sketch it in there, but two comma e squared would be here. Over here I have negative one comma one over e. And if we play the same games that we played to get the base two log from two to the x to get the natural log from e to the x, you will see that the graph of the natural log function looks like. This is one that, again, you need to commit to memory. Got to know what this looks like. Mark this as 1. Makes this about e. And that puts e squared somewhere out here. 1, 2, three. Here's the graph of the natural log. I will begin these points to make things a little better. There we go. Good enough. And then we approach our vertical asymptote down here. This would be one over e comma negative one coming from flipping this guy over. This zero comma one becomes one comma zero. This one comma e becomes e comma one. And this two comma e squared becomes e squared comma two. And just like when we talked about the the function e to the x, we said leave powers of e as powers of e. Don't try to write them as decimals. Same thing is true on the graph of the natural log. Just leave powers of e as powers of e. Now you do need to estimate their size as you draw these things, right? We need to know about how far e squared should be away from e and stuff like that. Um, just remember e is kind of close to three, so e squared should be kind of close to nine. It should be about three times bigger than this. It doesn't need to be perfect, but you should have a rough idea and you definitely need to know this shape, right? So all these logarithm graphs have this same shape. It is the exponential shape just flipped over the line y equals x. 
which explains where the asymptote comes from. The vertical asymptote here is the same as the base two logarithm, it's x equals zero. And the domain and range are the same. Zero to infinity. And negative infinity to infinity. So make sure you know this graph, right? Make sure you know this graph. Make sure you know the graphs of logarithm functions. I promise I will make you graph these on the next test. Questions on this? Or any of the transformation stuff? All right, then before I let you go, just one more thing. What I'm about to show you um, could be deduced from what we wrote before, but properties of the natural law. Same ones, the natural log of one is the number to which you raise e in order to get one, that's zero. The natural log of e is the number to which you raise e in order to get e, that's got to be one. And then that other pair of things, the natural log of e to some stuff, that's the base e log of e to some stuff, so that's got to be the stuff, whatever that stuff is, could be a function, could be whatever. And similarly, e raised to the power of the natural log of some stuff is just that stuff. Let's evaluate the natural log at a few points. And we're going to do this without a calculator. You've probably noticed the LN button on your calculator and the E button on your calculator. They will be useful sometimes. Um, but like I said on Tuesday, any homework problem that doesn't say to use a calculator, you should be doing without a calculator. There are a few towards the end that say use a calculator, but on all the others, we want to work without one. So we'll start simple, like the LN of E to the eight. And then we'll look for something like the ln of 1 over e squared. And then maybe the ln of e to the negative pi. And finally, how about the ln of the cube root of e? And always being careful to put the inside of the logarithm in parentheses. So, what is the ln of e to the a? A. Very good. All right, it's the ln of e to some stuff. The stuff is just a. What is the ln of 1 over e squared? Is it e to the negative 2? The inside is e to the negative 2. So let's start by rewriting this as the ln of e to the negative 2. That is uh, the crucial observation here for sure. So since 1 over e squared is e to the negative 2, the ln of 1 over e squared is the ln of e to the negative 2. And what is that? Negative 2. Very good, negative 2 itself. Uh, thinking in the same way, what is e to the negative pi? Negative pi. Very good. And what could I do to help me in part D? Uh, can you change it to one over E to the negative three? Almost. So we do want to use our properties of exponents on this but there's not going to be a one over e to something. It's e to the one over something. 
It's equal to one third. Very good, yeah. So remember the nth root is the one over nth power. So the one over goes in the power. So like the cube root of e is e to the one third. The square root of e would be e to the one half. Uh, the fifth root of e would be e to the one fifth. So the natural log of that is just one third. Okay, we're just about out of time here, but I do want to show you one more tiny thing. Uh, and this tiny thing has to do with domains. So you don't want to always have to draw the graph to get the domain. That's a lot of work. And sometimes drawing the graph is actually quite hard. If it's not a simple transformation, we need some way to get the domain. So we now have a third new domain red flag. Remember at the beginning of the semester, we talked about domain red flags. These are how we find domains algebraically without getting the graph. Sometimes we don't have the graph. That domain red flag is variables inside a logarithm. Right, you notice that the domain of ln x or log sub two of x or any of these logarithm functions is zero to infinity. In other words, you cannot take the log of a negative number. You cannot take the log of zero. If you have variables inside a logarithm, you need to make sure that at the inside, is strictly greater than zero. And the last thing I want to do before I let you go is just calculate two quick domains like this. So let's find the domain of the common log of 2x plus 1 and the ln natural log of 4 minus x squared. So again, the big thing is if you have any variables inside a logarithm, which we do here and here, you need to make sure that the inside is strictly greater than zero. In other words, to find the domain of functions like these, you need to solve an inequality. You need to take this inside, set it strictly greater than zero, and solve that inequality. X is greater than negative one half. Very good. So for the first one, we're going to solve the inequality 2x plus 1 is greater than zero. And the solution to this inequality we can find, because it is a linear inequality, we can find just by treating it like an equation. We'll subtract one from both sides. And I get 2x is greater than negative 1. And then divide both sides by 2 to get x is greater than negative 1 half. So this domain is the open interval from negative one half to positive infinity. The next one is a little bit more complicated, but it, it starts the same way. And then we just have to lean on the other stuff that we've learned. So for the second guy, we need to solve the inequality four minus x squared is strictly greater than zero. What kind of inequality is this? Or have we seen things like this recently? A 
cerrarle. Mm -hmm. Brackets may be involved in some problems like these. Um, but like what section in the book? What what lessons um, did we did we discuss these sort of things in? Like factoring? Yeah, yeah. This is a polynomial inequality. Right, so it is very possible that a problem from this section where you're finding domains of logarithms results in you needing to solve a polynomial or rational inequality. And the trick to solving this polynomial inequality, remember like all polynomial inequalities, you pull everything to one side, that's already been done for us. If necessary, we would have a common denominator. There's nothing to have a common denominator here. These are all just over one. So the first step um, would be to factor. And this factors as a difference of squares. That's 2 minus x times 2 plus x. So we have that is greater than 0. What do we do from here? I've got everything on one side, all put together nicely, all factored. What do we do next? Mm -hmm. we, can, we can grab the point. Right. Fine. Yeah, so we take those cut points that we come, we get from the factors, negative two from this factor, positive two from this factor. We plot them on a number line. And then in each of these regions, this thing will either be greater than zero or not. It will either be positive or negative in here, here, and here. And you get there a bunch of ways. We can use the end behavior of this polynomial because it's an even degree polynomial with a negative lead coefficient. We know he has to go down on both sides. Or you could test a point if you like. We can test x equals 0 in here. If I plug 0 into this inequality, I get 4 minus 0 is greater than 0. 4 minus 0 is positive, right? So this would be a, a plus here. And like we said, from the end behavior, we could say that either of these are negative, or you could use the multiplicity trick to say, since, for example, this negative 2 comes from this factor, which is multiplicity 1, we need to change sign as we hop over. This positive 2 comes from this factor, which is also multiplicity 1, so we need to change sign as we hop over. However you get there, you need to have this number line filled out with the signs. <clears throat> and then remember the inequality we're trying to solve, so the solution uh, the domain is the solution to the inequality, which is, we're asking where is 4 minus x squared strictly greater than 0? Where is this positive? That's from negative 2 to 2. So that's your domain. Okay, um, this is where we're going to stop for today. Next time, <sighs> next time we're going to talk about some algebra properties of logs, and all of those we will be able to deduce by thinking about them as the inverses to exponentials. So again, we don't have a formula for any of these logarithm functions. Formulas for these are really nasty, and they involve infinitely many terms. Can't do it but I will be able to cook up for you a list of like four or five really important algebra properties for logarithms. And they'll all come as kind of um, friends of the properties of exponents that we talked about, like a to the x times a to the y is a to the x plus y. Each one of those rules for exponents has a corresponding rule for logarithms. Uh, we are going to learn those rules and then we will practice manipulating logarithm expressions with those rules. Once we have all of that, we will be in good shape to start solving equations. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, I'll leave it here for today. Please work hard on that homework. I am going to publish one more small homework set for you guys, and also that um, Jello worksheet. So the, the new homework is going to be quite short, and it will be due next Tuesday, along with the homework that I opened for you this Tuesday. The Jello worksheet will go up uh, either today or tomorrow, and you'll have two weeks to get it handed in. Um, again, each each 
correct problem on the Jello worksheet will earn you a bonus point on the last midterm. Uh, please remember to work the Jello worksheet on your own. Do not work it with other people. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'll see you guys next week.